What is up, fellow football fans, and welcome back to another edition of the Oneta Show, brought to you by PTE. Now, welcome back. Apologies on the missing show last week. Beyond some things that were just going on technically that were making that extremely difficult uh, for me to get that up for you. More importantly, I've been working on a big project here for the podcast, and that is this. How to put the time in to fix college football. It is time to fix college football. Now, you'll probably be hinted at that the NCAA has got to go, and we've got to get closer to that college football playoff model. And you may think, what, what, what do you mean by that? But once we get closer to that college football playoff style model, we'll all have as wonderful a smile as Shador Sanders in this picture. Now, going back. I usually stick to professional football on this podcast. It's far more what I love and what I'm comfortable with. However, I do have a, a large affection for college football as it is even closer to the most foundational pieces of what make football such a great sport, what make it such a wonderful, wonderful experience for so many across this country and the world round now as we're getting to be such more of an international sport. And I'm excited because I'm getting more and more into college football, and I love getting into the nitty-gritty of the politics of it, the conferences, how do media deals get made. I love all that stuff. That is why I think it is time to propose something to fix college football. So this is part one of three. So part one of this new model We'll be going into suggestions on how to fix college football. Fix in quotations because everyone will have different opinions on that. But how I would personally go about fixing college football to make it a better place for athletes, teams, schools, who would have you. Part two, we're going to get into new conferences. So yes, I have redivided all 134 FBS schools into new conferences and that is for very very good and special reasons for that to make sure that this is a more perfect union and finally i'm going to go into a new college football playoff format and why i would be doing the things that i'd be doing to make sure that we get the best possible output into this without further ado it's time it's time to fix college football and that is why i have to say with a wonderful, wonderful oath here. We, the fans of college football, in order to form a more perfect union, establish the College Football Alliance to ensure football tranquility, provide for the common quality and promote the general welfare of competition and secure the blessings of Saturday to ourselves and our posterity to ordain and establish this college football alliance. Now, is that a wild way to say that? Of course it is. But it's in order to say that we need a more perfect union. And I thought, why not go to the Constitution just to do it for some fun? Now, there needs to be a disclaimer on all of this. College football already operates extremely well. And by that, we can say it makes plenty of money. We can say that there is general competition, but it's tiered competition for the most part. And that millions and millions of people across this country and now internationally all do enjoy college football in some way, shape, or form. But it is far from perfect. It needs to get better. And it's clear that its governing body is not working for college football, Um, which is why I brought this up now I was originally thinking this might be my August show as I'm going on vacation for a long time, so I'm getting a lot of stuff. Uh, I'll be in Alaska for three weeks. So I'm getting a lot of projects done now to make sure that you guys have quality content while I'm gone. Now, there's a disclaimer. The easiest way to say it is this. College football will never be perfect. But we can make college football alliance, as I'm calling it, to form a more perfect union, insinuating college football will never be perfect. 
but we can get closer to that in this and in this model, I have only gone with the Division 1A FBS school. So that's the 134 that can technically compete for a national championship. Um, Division 1AA, which is the FCS, um, is not, that's the football uh, championship series. That is all your Division 2 schools or Division 1 schools, sort of, double A ball. Division 1A is the ones that can actually compete for bowl games and can compete for a national championship. The easiest way to say this is to say the NCAA is not working. We've seen this now in the settlement with a $2.8 billion settlement in which the NCAA is going to be footing 41% of that, which would be far more, frankly. In my personal opinion, the way I read things and the way I do things. Me personally saying that. It's not as though the NCAA is out there with pitchforks and torches boycotting and trying to destroy good things. But they make nonsensical rules. The issue is this. We are in this quagmire in this. The NCAA is an organization that exists in order to govern college sports and make sure college sports is represented as best as it possibly can. Now, the idea behind the NCAA is a good one. The problem is 75 plus percent of all college sports money comes from, I believe it technically it might be 74%, but nonetheless, Three-fourths of all college football revenue or all of college sports revenue comes from college football. It is what funds athletic departments. It is what does this. It is the reason why outside of the NCAA tournament, it's the only real interesting thing about college sports on a wide basis. You know, there's plenty of people that love college basketball, college baseball, all the like. There's nothing wrong with being a fan of that. If that's what you're a fan of, that's great. But the reality is in this country, when it comes to college sports, college football dominates. But the NCAA tries to take all sports and all athletes and govern the same way, and it can't do that. Because it just doesn't work. Even if you look at the new settlement deal and how possibly college football can be used um, in a way in which, I believe it is now going to be $20 million can be spent from schools to give directly to money. Inherently, that is part of a Title IX claim. Title IX, which I believe in, is a great thing. Title IX, problem with that is this. If you're looking at revenue sharing, if you are looking at interest, if you are looking at, God, you know, just general money-making capability and reality, you're going to inherently have athletes being paid more or less than others, even in the same institution, due to the money and interest that they bring. When you recruit a five-star quarterback into your program, that's going to garner far more national interest and national media attention, such as Texas with Arch Manning. That's going to garner far more media interest than recruiting the best women's gymnast or the best college baseball player or the best softball player for that matter doesn't matter there is almost like 99 percent more interest based on that because of the popularity of the sport so they're driving more money to them they are driving more money from college football than anything else if you say that title nine has to impact that then you have to pay everybody equally which I'm not inherently against, but then it makes it incredibly difficult to then even fix college football because then either A, we pay everyone the same, which fine, but then schools are going to start cutting different programming to try to increase the ability for them to get higher level athletes in certain sports. That's a very likely possibility, which I do not want to happen, or most people do not want to happen. Or... We could go a different route, escape the NCAA, and go for 
if you are paying athletes, inherently, amateurism is dead. You then can get antitrust exemptions and Title IX exemptions because you're not inherently su subject to them, which is probably the best way for college football to do it. They would escape the NCAA model of amateurism and there go that way. Because already I, I've consulted a legal friend on this matter who's also a big college football fan and the future settlements based off of existing antitrust exemptions that the NCAA colleges schools have are problematic because they they determine future things without future representation and other stuff so it's inherently difficult to say what that could do so the settlement isn't going to work it's a stopgap measure to get to where it needs to be so if you really want to go forward you have to you have to be able to operate in a different realm the ncaa isn't doing its job in protecting everybody the best way possible. It's starting to feel very witch hunty from a lot of people's perspective, and I understand that, and I agree with that, which is why I am anti-NCAA. The NCAA is a governance body which everyone puts into, but yet they... It's very strange how it's created and founded by schools. It's supported by schools, but then... Athletic directors, conference commissioners, things of that matter can go do wildly different things with revenue, with money, with staffing, but they then can't appoint people to committees and do other things. And you may say, well, that's good. Then they can't have as much power. But then they can control so much of the benefits of the NCAA, but they can't control the detractors and the governance of the NCAA. So it's a double-edged sword that isn't quite working. So in my opinion... I believe we need to form College Football Alliance, which would be something like the College Football Playoff. So, to show this to you as I go forward here. So, that is the preamble to the United States Constitution that I got to here for you. However, let's see where we're... Where we're. we're going to go here. How does college sports revenue generating landscape? The schools generate direct revenue from ticket sales, merchandise, donations, and other sources. Schools are organized into athletic conferences that generate their own direct revenue from TV broadcast contracts and tournaments, then distribute money to schools. So the NCAA serves as a governing body making and monitoring rules at the school level, generating its own direct revenue from championship tournaments, distributing the surplus to schools. Bowl games and postseason tournaments are independent entities that generate direct revenue and distribute to conferences and schools. So why is that relevant in this conversation? We're talking NCAA versus the idea of the college football playoff. The college football playoff is not governed or owned by the NCAA. For instance, when we see the NCAA now 68 team tournaments for both men's and women's basketball, that's owned by the NCAA. That's how they have 99.99%, I'm sorry, for screen readers, this way, of all of their revenue is made off of that, essentially. The vast majority of their revenue that funds the NCAA is garnered off the 68 tournament from the NCAA March Madness tournaments of men and women's basketball. They're wildly successful. We all love them. That's great. But they don't own the college football playoff. The college football playoff is owned by the 12 conferences and independently by Notre Dame. All the schools and the conferences have a say into how the college football is, playoff is run. They have their own self-governance there to determine that. Is that a perfect system? No. However, they have direct control over their destinies and do things. In an odd way, it's a miniature style of the NFL. We all work. We all cooperate. We create this, and we send the four best teams to the playoff. Now, next year, that's establishing to 12, and there are already plans to expand to 14. I will get to the playoff again in a later show. However, that model is what possibly should be used, in my opinion, to 
formulate the College Football Alliance. So as we go forward, we have to say, how do we use this model? We're getting rid of the NCAA as our governance body. We're not going to be a part of the NCAA for this sport. Perhaps it still exists. However, we don't need the National Collegiate Athletic Association anymore for college football. We have the College Football Alliance, which is going to be operated as its governance body with membership fees and overall media revenue sharing. Now, as we go forward, we can go back here to the media deals and how media deals kind of split up into how we do things here. So I'm going to take you here to another useful little tool here on Sportico. So over at Sportico, this is generally the revenue breakdown of U.S. sports leagues. The NFL is probably our best model to use because it, A, it's the most successful in the country, but B, beyond and it's the most popular, it's our direct comparison because it's the same sport, same interests, um, and same success rate for the most part of how we govern the sport. So their national revenue breakdown is this. They get 66% of their revenue from national revenue, meaning television deals and that such the like. You get 17% of them is for seating and suites, Team membership sponsorships are worth 10%. Local media is about 1.8%. And then concessions and parking and other things would be 6.6%. Okay. Now, this is how every league breaks down their revenue of how they garner cash, how they garner money. You're going to naturally assume your local media is going to be higher here because of how many small level schools you will have. So you'd still be able as a school to get local media deals to allow for that. And then you may take part of that and throw it into the football alignment as part of its revenue. So the schools would keep the, re the vast majority of the local media revenue, but they'd go from there. But national television deals are what's really going to drive us here. So let's go forward and let's go here to the list of United States over the air and elevator network. So it's maybe Wikipedia, but it's a very good, useful thing to see. The vast majority of college football's money comes from television. Broadcast television, almost essentially at this point, is held together by sports and news. You can say there are other shows, and that's not disputing that. However, the vast majority of money and the reason broadcast television can still exist is because of sports and news. So you have NBC, CBS, ABC. They all partner with college football, as does Fox. Fox has uh, Big Noon Saturday, and they have Big Noon football. So you're going to be getting that wonderful Big Ten football. The CW can get involved as well. And technically, you could go with PBS, but no one's going to go with PBS. The other thing about My Network TV, it's owned by Fox, although it's technically its own network. It is a subsidiary of Fox which is another option. We also have ESPN in this big deal here. Now, again, it may seem like a bit of rambling, but these are all options. We saw that pie chart down that 66% of the NFL's revenue model comes from television, marketing, covering deals. That is why I showed that. Those are all possibles and viable partners to get us to a profitable margin at another place for college football. The idea behind the Football Alliance, I'm only giving you money takes right now so you can see how it could operate. We're going to make the vast majority of our revenue from TV and media, but we're also going to get shares of ticket sales, concession sales, parking sales, local media. You could even get boosters involved if you really would like to, or you could get private donation if you would like to, because you could easily set this up as a nonprofit entity as well, such as the National Football League is, which is absurd to say, but technically it's a nonprofit. Someone who's worked for a nonprofit before, I can tell you we don't play for the same rules, but nonetheless, that is how it's set up. So here you have all these different avenues to make money to govern 134 participating schools in college football. Now, how does this fix college football? One, you are self-determining your rules. You can start 
with conference commissioners and things of that nature going over and helping aid in the rules process while also giving third party people who can then get involved as first party people but have an outside say so you have outside opinions outside lawyers things of that nature who do not have a vested interest in a single conference being successful and get those third parties to turn into first parties to make the governance fair second of all through revenue sharing splits let's just pick a number let's use the ncaa settlement number $20 million. I went as low as 10 and then put it in the middle of 15. Each school in the FBS through revenue sharing is given $15 million to pay their players. Maybe it could be as low as 10. Maybe you could go lower into 5, 6, what have you. You make it the best reasonable number that you possibly can. But this allows every school from Alabama, Birmingham, all the way up to Alabama. All the way from James Madison, all the way up to Michigan. You have schools that then can start to at least start paying for players a little bit better. And the ironic part is this, is once payments can begin... Theoretically, we can start allowing athletes to have better choices to go to different schools. Now, we will obviously always have powerhouses. That's why I said this will never be perfect. College football can never be perfect. But perhaps with a pool of money that we all share and get along with, such as the NFL model, we can start to begin to even the playing field. So smaller schools may be able to grow their athletic programs and their football programs specifically to be better equipped to compete with these larger schools that are certainly seemingly unstoppable. Even with Nick Saban leaving Alabama, Kalen DeBoer is a phenomenal head coach at a college level. Kalen DeBoer is going to make sure Alabama sticks around as a top 10 team. It's not as if Georgia's ever just going to suck with Kirby Smart. Georgia's going to be a top 10 powerhouse pretty much forever now. You have Texas that will always be here. Ohio State will always be there. Michigan will always be there. You have your powerhouses that are going to stay that way because they have been that way for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 plus years. Sure, they've had down periods, but they all make their way back because they are the institutions of the sport. But allowing that 10, 15, 20 million dollars, whatever the settlement that's agreed upon by the 134 schools of the alliance, they all put money in based off the revenues that they all get and they split it evenly to pay players. Simple as that. So already you're looking at, let's see, two, so you're looking at 268. Add a zero to that. You're spending about $2 billion if you did $20 million. So it'd be quite a bit of money to try to establish. However, if you look at the figures and say, there's no way that's possible, <laughs> think again here, my friends. So we have this over to allow that. So I just gave you a $2 billion figure. That's a lot of money. So maybe it couldn't be $20 million. It'd be 10. Maybe it could be five, but at least it's something to allow everyone to compete. If you believe that's ridiculous, there's no way there's that much money into this. <laughs> Again, my friends, we go over here and look, the Big 12, not even the best football conference, which is losing its powerhouses after this year, just distributed a record $470 million okay, of revenue distribution. Now, let's keep going into this one. The Big Ten reported revenues of $879.9 million. $852.6 million for the SEC. This was over a fiscal year. ACC, 617 to 707 last year. Pac-12, Pac-12 was dying. 
dying. And it still made $600 million last year. That is an insane amount of money in a fiscal year to say that you had that you had generated that much revenue. Now you can say, well, that's not all college football. Sure, it's not all college football. Let's go with that story. It's not all college football. How much of that money do you think was generated by college football? Get through, guys. Now there is some NCAA money in that. I can't deny that. But when you eliminate that partner and the NCAA makes that money off of basketball, you're still benefiting from that. You're doing those things. You can spread those out to your other schools or to your other school programs. You can do that to other athletic programs. You can take the NCAA's money that you're making because you're still part of the NCAA for other sports, but for college football, you don't need it anymore. You can rely on Television deals, ticket sales, concession stands, all that kind of money. You can do all that with the alliance. So even if you bring a reasonable amount of money to share, it's worthwhile. Now, schools in this deal could then spend an unlimited amount towards payer payment. Payer payment. Player payment. There it is. Player payment. Now, that inherently institutes, well, how is that any different than what it has been? It's on the up and up. It'll be recorded. And if it's a nonprofit, theoretically, you could also make it public record if you wished. And they're public institutions, the vast majority of them. So you would at least probably have a record of their employees and how they're doing things, which is what the players could possibly be paid as. So you could have a record instead of just going... No, 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 they were never paid back in the day. Or now where you have NIL deals that are kind of the Wild West that are making college football better, but also a little bit more unhinged at times as well because I'm all for players being paid. But the governance is just wild on this one. If you want an idea of how wild it is, go listen to Greg Sankey's last comments. He's the commissioner of the SEC. Go see his latest comments on NIL deals from, I believe, their January meeting. And you tell me whether he believes it's governed properly or not. And say what you will, either though you may be anti-commissioner and anti-college sports commissioning like that, or if you're pro that guy. The guy's clearly smart and knows what the hell he's talking about and knows what he's doing. So no matter what, whether you love it or you hate it or you love him or you hate him or whatever... There is value in his words to think about that. But then this allows you to have a more up and up thing where we can say, all right, we are starting to be able to pay that way. Our ticket sales are going to go up a little bit for a lot of these smaller schools. Why is that? Because they're going to have the opportunity to pay against bigger schools a little bit more. Or television dollars come in their way because they may be on television more often at a higher level than a lower level because they're playing higher level schools. But again, you can still pay an unlimited amount for players. And you can garner that through booster donations, your media, your local media revenue sharing that you get or whatever share you get of a media deal. There's also digital media deals and nobody, ironically because it's sports and it's so broadcast television based or cable television based, no one has really broken into. We've just seen a huge, huge investment from Netflix to get into both the NFL and the WWE, which even if you aren't a huge wrestling fan, you have to say it's kind of sports adjacent. Netflix is now broadcasting sports this year for the National Football League. Amazon, the world's biggest goddamn retailer, they are trying to get more into sports. They already have sports of every kind. You have all these different entities that are getting into streaming as well. So you have streaming deals, booster, booster donations. You can make name, image, and likeness deals for the school, theoretically, and then pay the players through that. 
And you can still have NIL deals, but then they can be controlled into those things. There is theoretically a way you could partner with the NCAA to start this, but I wouldn't recommend that because then you're kind of just being stuck to where you were. The only thing that makes this somewhat tricky is the current television deals. I'd have to go look into every conference's specific deal. However, the easiest one to say is this. The college football playoff is currently with ESPN through 2031-32 season. Now, I'm sure there's even larger deals after that. So you'd have to make sure that the new conferences, the new conferences, would all have to coincide their television deal ending. So perhaps when you're two years short of another conference, you make a two-year extension. This is all wild speculation, and I, there's so many legs to this that I can't possibly do it alone. However, these are ideas to help college football. So you'd need to make sure television deals all go forward. You need new scheduling bodies to start, all kinds of things to really get this off the ground and working. However, it would enrich the sport of college football to make it more competitive, more regulated in a realistic way that it's fair to player and to institution, and make it worthwhile. And I'm going to pose this to you to tease you with this. We no longer would have 12 conferences, 10 conferences or whatever the hell it is, and an independent Notre Dame that's not independent, but they are, whatever. We go here. We're all willingly doing this. So we go to this. We have old conferences and we have new conferences. Our old conferences in name, they may not always be the same teams, but we are going to six conferences. The Big Ten the Big 12, and the SEC, because we still want our brand recognition there. Those are going to be the conference names that we quote-unquote keep. And then we're going to have three new conferences, the Smoky Mountain Conference, the Northeastern Conference, and the Pac West. And to give you a small taste of that, we're going to go here. Big 10, you still have your bigger institutions there. That those big powerhouses that you always see in the Big Ten will still be there. The spirit of the conference will still be there with some slight changes. The Big 12 is going to get souped up. Obviously, you're going to have to absorb some teams. And it will be reinvigorated to be worthwhile. Teams will want to stay in that conference because you're self-governing that way. You can make it so that everyone's happy. The SEC will start garnering... Perhaps a Florida State, but they'll still have their classic institutions as well. And these new conferences here. We got the NEC, which is really taking care of the northeastern part of the country. Got our armies and our navies, our name brands like Penn State and West Virginia, and even more. The Pacific West Conference, which can really take care of, <laughs> when you look at it, the western third or the western half of the country when it comes to FBS schools. Smoky Mountain Conference, you get your big boys like Clemson, Tennessee, and consistent players such as North Carolina, Louisville, Kentucky. And this is all going to lead, these new conferences are all going to lead into a 16-team new playoff format. I'm going to tease you with that to go forward. That is going to allow, this new college football line is going to allow teams to compete with regulated schedules where they don't plan out games 14 years in advance with regulated schedule makers, regulated money, which creates a regulated playing field that makes it better for fans, makes it better for players, and frankly, institutions will benefit because on top of that, I'll tell you this, I made our conferences pretty regional-based, to be honest with you. But nonetheless, 
and keep the tradition and the wonderful history of college football alive while making sure it thrives for the next 25, 50, 200 years going forward to preserve the sport as best we possibly can. That is how we, friends, are going to fix college football. We are going to eliminate the NCAA, and we're going to go to the College Football Alliance, which is based off the idea of self-governance from the college football playoff. But it's not necessarily self-governance, because once again, you're all pooling together to create a new organization, which will form rules for everyone that are agreed upon by everybody. Everyone will have a say, and then everyone's bound to them, and people that work for the organization, the College Football Alliance, not the SEC, not the Big Ten, College Football Alliance will then have the responsibilities to make sure all rules and regulations are followed, player treatment is there, institutional treatment is accurate, and everyone has a level playing field to make sure that the sport, this wonderful sport known as college football, will last for decades upon decades in quality competition. And we ourselves have the blessed Saturday of fun that we asked for. So that is part one of three of this college football trilogy, starting with the formation of the College Football Alliance to form a more perfect union of college football. Now, if you liked my work today, before I go into my usuals, I gotta ask you, my friends, go check out our other stuff. Monday through Friday, we got all kinds of cool stuff over at our YouTube channel. So if you're listening on Spotify, head over to the YouTube channel. If you're on YouTube, you already know here, just make one click and you go see our other stuff. Monday, we get some cool stuff over with some Pokemon variety and Pokemon pack openings. Tuesday, it's the flagship show, the Onetta show. We're talking gaming. We're talking movies. We're talking anything we want to talk about over on the Onetta show. We do have a little bit of football crossovers quite a frequent bit over at the Onetta show. Wednesday, you got the Pokemon Bliss and Oblivion project. Thursday, you're already here. You know it. It's the Onetta football show. Where I'm giving you genius ideas like the college football lines. And Friday, it's that rotational basis. We got the adventure show to plan your next adventure. We got the brick builder show to see some Lego kit builds and have some fun there. We got Pokemon card pack openings again. We got Yu-Gi-Oh card pack openings. We may even have the first tease. You know what? I'll just straight up tell you. First time ever. We're going to try to get into Lorcana. We're going to do a Lorcana pack opening. Will that be good for me? I have no idea. But you can see it there. And I'm also going to ask you this, folks. It would be really helpful. If you could, go support us here. Over at Etsy, go to ptecreative.etsy.com and you can get yourself a world of fun merchandise. Make sure that you get yourself something real, real nice and good for yourself. Over there at the Etsy shop, we've got bunch of cool stuff we got hats we got stickers we got t-shirts we got hoodies we have our own fashion line we have stickers for the football fan we're gonna have some more college football merch soon we're all gonna have lots of fun stuff if you're over there go buy yourself some wonderful stuff some wonderful merch and support pt creative business model if you will it helps me and every person who works and helps me with PTE Creative, PTE Creative, because we're just all artists that want to make cool content for all of our friends and family and friends and family on the internet, which we love dearly. So I hope you enjoyed part one of three of this college football trilogy. Hopefully we don't have to break this up, but if we get some major, major football news, college or professional related in the NFL, we may have to break it up, but I'm going to try to make sure we get a week-to-week-to-week one, which is going to be very fun for everybody over there. This has been part one. If you enjoyed it, like, comment, subscribe, send us a review on Spotify, share this with as many fans as you can. If you think this is a stupid idea, tell me. If you think this is a genius idea and you have a better way to explain it, tell me. We're here to fix college football. It'd be great. Go check out our socials over on TikTok and Instagram as well. And head over to Etsy shop to get yourself some cool merch. Because that would be super dope if you could do that. But once again, thank you all 
so, so much for listening and watching. It is appreciated. Coming over on the other Yonetta show, we got some more Smash Bros. talk. We got more pack openings on Monday coming, and we're going to have that new Lorcana opening on Friday, and we got new Pokemon on Wednesday. So go check out the rest of our content over on YouTube. It's going to be fun for you, and enjoy it. That has been this episode of the Onetta Football Show. I am your host, Evan Davies, signing out from PTE Creative. Peace, love, and hugs to everyone on the internet for a blissful Saturday of college football eventually. Peace.